Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here, and uh, thank you for coming. I know it's a very busy time for everyone, so whether you're uh, uh, getting ready for exams or, or preparing exams or grading papers or whatever, uh, thank you for taking the time to be here um, to hopefully understand a little bit more about the craziness that's going on in my part of the world. Uh, as I left my hotel this morning, my friends were battling the Muslim Brotherhood and the police on the streets of Cairo outside the presidential palace. And it's kind of hard to be away from that. <laughs> uh, so I'm, I'm kind of torn because I want to be with them because, you know, I need to know what's happening and I need to be there. That's usually uh, what I do these days. <laughs> um, but on the other hand, it's, uh, it's good to be here and uh, hopefully uh, spread the world internationally about what's happening in, in my country. And, uh, and hopefully together we can kind of make sense uh, of that. Uh, most of my research is about the use of social media, so that's what I'll be um, uh, talking about. Uh, of course, we'll focus on what's happening you know, more recently because that's where everybody's talking about now. Uh, but it's also important for me to give you a little bit of a, of a background of, of how this came about, because it really lead, all leads to, to understanding what's happening. Um, so I will be talking a little bit about the role of social media really before the, you know, before the 25th of January 2011 and during the 18 days which uh, brought down uh, Mubarak, who was our dictator for 30 years, and then post uh, that time and what's been happening uh, since then. Uh, and I'll be using a lot of these images, which uh, many of them have went viral during the revolution, which kind of reminds us of, uh, you know, what, what really happened. <laughs> oh, if you think this is funny, there will be a lot more entertaining <laughs> pictures. <right? laughs> this is like the least entertaining of all. <laughs> no, it's actually a good picture. I like that picture because it's a very expressive picture of, uh, of what what was uh, of what these people thought was happening uh, these are all you know very normal people I mean we don't know I don't know this guy's name for example but um, but he's somebody who was on a square somewhere around the world you know holding that uh, sign and it's a testament to how he felt uh, the role of social media was in uh, in this revolution uh, so I'm going to be talking about a few things, including, you know, was it an internet revolution? This is the question that I've been asked the most since, you know, 2011. Uh, I've been talking about this for almost two years now. Was it an internet revolution? And I'll, I'll tell you what I, what I mean by that exactly. And we'll also talk about the role of social media, really, and the role of social media in link to other forms of media outlets, particularly traditional media and interpersonal communication, because it all came together to do something. Um, but my thesis on was it an, an internet revolution is I think it was an internet-based revolution. And that kind of takes me away from having to say, yes, it was an internet revolution, because I mean, this has been going on for decades before the internet ever came into existence. Uh, and it also emphasizes the role that social media have played because I do think they have played an important role and I'll be talking a lot about uh, that role. Let me just ask you if I move around the, the room will I drive you crazy? Should I be? It's okay. Yeah? yeah? Okay. Uh, okay. <laughs> Because I like to be a little, you know, come out of, out of the podium but sometimes if I'm being videotaped people go crazy with that. So. Uh, my, my thesis on was it an internet revolution is that it was kind of an internet-based revolution. And what I mean by that is that, no, Facebook did not go to Tahrir Square. We, we know that. Um, the people went to Tahrir Square. But the people were mobilized and organized by Facebook and Twitter. So at least large sections of these people, not everybody, but large sections of these people. And it kind of played a role to, as to, to making people ready to go down to the streets when that time was ripe, and I'll again tell you what I mean by that and how that uh, came about. But just a bit of demographics, Egypt is a country of about uh, 83 million people with about seven more living outside of Egypt. Um, illiteracy rates, it's a huge problem. We have over almost one third of the population is illiterate, as in they cannot read and write. And in my opinion, that's actually something that um, our regimes have done on purpose, almost. 
because it's uh, more beneficial to them to keep the people ignorant. If people start learning and if they uh, learn how to think critically, then it becomes uh, a, a lot more of a threat to them. And that, by the way, happens all over the world, not just in Egypt. So, uh, you know, I always tell my students that critical thinking is very important <laughs> if there's anything to take out of any class. It's how to think critically. Because you can get a university education, you can get a university degree and post your degree on the wall and be very happy with it, but you can still might not be able to think critically about the issues presented to you. You might not be able to, to tell where the truth is. Well, th truth, of course, is a very you know, uh, flexible term, but a <laughs> relative term. But uh, there is something happening, and there is media coverage of that something happening. And these two things are usually not the same. And the more media literate you are, and the more uh, of a critical mind you are, the more you might be able to to form an idea of what's actually happening on the ground in, in, as opposed to what you're seeing on television or reading in newspapers. Um, so actually, I think all regimes all around the world try to almost prevent their citizens from being critical thinkers. Because once you think critically, you start doubting and you start questioning the regimes. And that's not to, any, to anybody's benefit who's in power. That's to the benefit of the people. But it's not to the benefit of the regimes anywhere. And so uh, it's kind of universal in that sense. But in Egypt, it has been like literally people cannot read and write. And that's over one third of the population. Uh, about 20 to 40% live under the poverty line. We're talking about $1 to $2 a day. So it's, uh, again, very uh, strenuous for these people. Uh, internet penetration is now almost at 37%, uh, which is a relatively high uh, penetration rate, uh, let me tell you, it has almost doubled uh, since the revolution. So when the revolution broke out, it was around 21%, 2021. So I think by, you know, by January of next year, when we would be at the, our second uh, anniversary of when this started, it would have almost doubled uh, in terms of internet users. Uh, and also, actually, in terms of social media users, social media users have, have uh, uh, ex exploded, <laughs> I mean, even more than that. Let me just tell you, for example, on, in January 2011, we had 4.1 million users on Facebook. Today, we have close to 12 million. So it's almost tripled. And part of that is that people realized, you know, there's something happening there. I mean, you know, if you wanted your news, that's where you, that's where you went to get it. Uh, and it was very much exemplified, actually, by SCAF, the Supreme Council of Armed Forces, which ruled the country after Mubarak fell down. They had their official uh, statements uh, to the country released on Facebook. And you know, so the journalists were reporting, you know, as released on their official website on Facebook. And I'm like, really? OK. <laughs> so you know, on, on their official Facebook page, you know, SCAF said so and so. And it was, it was kind of funny, but it was also a testament to, to the power that even the army acknowledges that these uh, social media are having on, on people. This is like the first source of information that um, particularly the young people go to, but eventually a lot more uh, of Egypt's population goes to. Uh, mobile phone, cell phone penetration is uh, really, uh, has really taken off in Egypt. We now have more mobile phones than we have people. So we have a penetration rate of 111%. Uh, that, of course, goes to people you know, having two and three phone sets on hand. Uh, and it also has to do with the, the technology itself becoming very cheap. So now you can get a mobile phone with a line um, in Egypt for like maybe you know, $20. Uh, and so it has encouraged even the very uh, socioeconomically unprivileged to have one because it actually helps them with their work. A lot of them work in the, in the informal sectors of the economy. So they're like plumbers or electricians or something like that. And these people make very little money in Egypt. But if you're on the job, then it's easier for other clients to find you and to tell you, you know, come over to this address because you have another job coming up. And that basically helps you make more money. So uh, it was beneficial for them in this regard. These are all forms of social media that you may or may not be familiar with, um, including blogs, actually, which are considered kind of a social media. Uh, the ones that have taken off in Egypt were basically Facebook and Twitter, the ones that are most popular. Blogging was very popular in Egypt since it started. 
2005, um, the Egyptian bloggers basically led the, the led that region, the Arab world, in terms of both in terms of numbers and in terms of uh, effect, because they were blogging about um, politics where nobody else was, uh, and that sort of led the whole region, led other youth in you know in Kuwait, in Saudi Arabia, in places where nobody really talked about politics at all to start you know, getting uh, in that rhythm and doing some of that as well. Uh, but this picture is very um, expressive, I think, and is, it, it, it kind of tells the story that I, that I want to tell you. This is you on social networking. <laughs> so it's you and it's everybody on the periphery kind of looking at you. So you are in the center of attention on your Facebook page or Twitter. How many people here are on Facebook? Nice. All right. How many are on Twitter? Okay, get on Twitter. <laughs> get on Twitter. It's important. That's where the news is. <laughs> get on Twitter. Um, yeah, but that's, that happens everywhere I go. I ask these questions and the same thing happens. A lot more people are on Facebook than on Twitter. But let's take Facebook, for example. If you're on your Facebook page, literally all your friends are looking at you. So you are the center of the universe, and everybody kind of, you know, they, they look at the comments you post, they look at the videos you post, they look at the pictures you post. Um, you are free to, uh, to uh, post, of course, whatever you like. You are free to delete their comments if you don't like it, <laughs> or delete something that somebody else has posted on your wall. Uh, so basically, whatever you do, everybody else watches. If you have, you know, 100 friends, or if you have... Uh, 900 friends, they're all kind of watching what you're doing because that space is your space, which is why, of course, my space was such an ingenious name because it really exemplified what was happening at the time. You know, this is my space, so I'm going to do with it whatever I please. In a country like Egypt, that becomes very important because the young people of Egypt have no other space that they can call my space. This was almost the first piece of space that they can claim as their own without direct intervention from somebody telling them what to do or what not to do. Uh, and that was very important because this idea of a space of my own is important for people to learn to express themselves. Even if you're talking about what you had for breakfast today, the idea that you are, you know, uh, posting something about this sushi restaurant that you're going to, and then people are actually commenting on whether you know, uh, they like sushi or not, or on whether that restaurant is good or not, or on whether you know, uh, it's worth going to that place or not, or whether it's expensive or not, whatever it is. Even, uh, even if it sounds trivial, even if it's totally unrelated to politics, but it says something about, you know what, I have something to say, it's important to me, I will say it, and other people will read it and will care and will comment on it. To the young people in Egypt and the Arab world in general, that's a novelty. I mean, that is so unprecedented, you know. Uh, and it's an important cultural difference that you might not think of, you know, first thing uh, in this part of the world, but it's very real. Uh, in Egypt, we have been living under emergency laws for as many years as you can go back since basically the 1952. They call it revolution, but it's really a coup d'etat by, by the military. Um, and what that meant is that um, the police, or the army, literally, uh, has the right to detain you and take you to jail. Nobody would ever hear about you again, possibly, if you are standing with four friends on a street corner or actually in someone's apartment. If there, are, if there is a gathering of five people or more, the security forces have the right to detain you, no matter what you're talking about. That's what emergency laws state. And so that automatically just generates this huge culture of fear you know, all the time. I mean, if, you're, if they can do that for anything, I'm not going to talk about politics. Why should I? You know, I'm living with, uh, you know, with my family. I'm safe. I'm OK. I go to school and back or to work and back. You know, I'm fine. I don't need to get into this because it's very heated uh, grounds. It's a, it's a very dangerous area to step on. And so when blogging was introduced before Facebook, and then these young people started writing about politics, it was such a novelty that they gained huge following. 
I mean, some of them at the time had 70,000 uh, followers, 80,000 followers. And let me tell you that, that that is more than the daily circulation of Egypt's largest newspapers. So for these people who are young, you know, I mean, some of them were teens, literally. Most of them were in their early 20s. Uh, to have that kind of following, and then, you know, I mean, if you're at the beginning kind of reluctant about posting a political comment, eventually you get the courage because, you know, people are talking and talking and talking and they're talking in language that you've never heard before. It's very courageous. It's very, you know, out there in your face kind of thing. And they are not afraid. And so that kind of gives you courage to at least, or pulls your leg kind of, you know, to, to respond to something. Uh, one day or to disagree with something or to argue with something and eventually you sort of get caught into this uh, conversation. But Facebook kind of did the same thing uh, on a larger scale because you know a lot of people had Facebook pages much more so than they had blogs uh, and on Facebook as I said you could be talking about anything trivial but you learn to express yourself and you learn that whatever you have to say even if it sounds trivial is actually kind of important to somebody because somebody replied to that comment. And you know what? Even if it's not important, you just posted it anyway. <laughs> right? And that's important because that shows you that you have the right to express yourself. And in our part of the world, that was such an important thing to learn. That's such an important lesson. I will say what I want to say. Why? Because I want to say it. That's enough. <laughs> that's enough of a reason why to say it. There is also something very interesting about that pattern that you're seeing. In order for you to be on a social network, in order to play the game, you're going to have to, at some point in time, to click on somebody else's name and comment on something they wrote, comment on their page, or post something on their page. Or, you know, this is how the interaction happens. This is how it's a network, right? And the moment you do that, literally, at a click of a mouse, you become the person on the periphery, and somebody else is in the middle of the circle. And so, literally, you have to learn that there is, there is a reciprocal kind of unwritten codes of respect, almost, for people's right to speak out. Because, literally, at the click of a mouse, you're not going to be the center of the universe anymore. You're just going to be one of the people on the outskirts of the circle. Somebody else is going to take that role. And if you don't want to play that, if you want to become the center of the universe all the time, then it's not going to work because nobody will start responding to. I mean, after a while, you know, you have to you have to communicate with people. If you don't care about what they post on your on your web page, you don't reply back. Then eventually, you know, nobody will respond to you anymore. So that I think was very important because, in my opinion, it created what I call a a, a scheme of horizontal communication that was not present in Egypt and in the Arab world before. In the Arab world, people talk at you from above. They don't talk to you. Uh, they, don't, they don't engage in a conversation with you. They give you directives from above. That's true for the government, definitely. That's actually the government expects that. The regime expects that at all times. Uh, but it's also true even of your family. It's true of the, you know, we live in a very patriarchal society in, uh, in the Arab world. Uh, and so it's true that uh, your, your family kind of expects to tell you what to do until you're an adult. And even if you're an adult, good luck trying to get out of that, um, particularly if you're female. If you're male, okay, you're probably going to get married and move to another house, and, 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 and then you'll become the person talking down to somebody else. But you're never <laughs> going to be talking you know, to them. And of course, I'm kind of exaggerating, and I'm giving you a very stereotypical image that's not, it's not exactly like that, but, it's, but these are... Historically and culturally, these have been like the main lines along which communication patterns have occurred. Uh, this is changing now, and it's changing big time. And it's changing in part because people have learned to speak horizontally to each other, or at least are learning. They're learning that they can be equals. Uh, I, was, I was talking at Stanford the other week, and I was telling somebody... Um, that it's very interesting to watch the language that people now use, and not even like um, you know star bloggers. Like we're talking about like everyday people whose names you have you don't know, you've never come across before. But to watch the language uh, by which they talk to the president, 
to the account of Mohammed Morsi, who is, you know, the Egyptian president. Whether or not he's actually on the other side of the account, it doesn't matter. You know, this is the president of Egypt. And to watch the ridicule <laughs> and the sarcasm and the insults that that account gets. Good or bad, you know, I'm not for insulting people, obviously, but it actually, I mean, it, it, it's nice to see that because it tells you that these lines of fear and, and hierarchy have forever been broken. They don't care if that person is the president. You know, I mean, to think that this could have happened 10 years ago with Mubarak, that's just, I mean, that's just out of the question. In part because these tools were not available. So really, you had no way of talking to, <laughs> to Mubarak. But even if they had been, you know, uh, and, and literally like three, four years ago, that would have never been possible. Uh, and so, so something there changed in, in the basic nature of how people communicate and in the people's realizing that, you know what, I have the right to talk to you. And you are not my superior, you are my equal. Even if you're the president, I don't care. If you're the president, you work for me. I pay your salary. This is my taxpayer's money. You work for me. And I'm going to address you as such. And that is so important to learn, actually worldwide. And I'll claim that a lot of societies, even in the so-called democratic world, um, do not have that. It's very important for us to all remember you know, that these people work for us. <laughs> whoever is in the regime, whoever is in power, that person is there because I voted for him or her. And I pay their salary every month. And their job is to serve me. So really, I am the person who's supposed to be in charge. I am the person that they're supposed to be accountable to. Uh, and I'm not, of course, saying that you know, Facebook like necessarily democratized the whole region. I mean, that's, you know, that's such a stretch, of course. But, but it did have a subtle influence. In 2009, I wrote an article called the, the Federal Democratic Republic of Facebook. And I was comparing Facebook to a federal democratic republic in terms of how the structure of the network is, uh, is set up, but also in terms of most necessarily, in terms of why are the Arab youth so um, enticed to join Facebook. What is attractive about Facebook to these young people? And I went into this whole you know, uh, uh, set of, of, of uh, observations about you know, things like, well, Facebook won't torture you if you say something against them. You know? I mean, it's as simple as that. Uh, if you say something about the regime in Egypt, you are likely to be in, in grave danger. Facebook is not going to do that to you. So there is a reason why people feel a sense of belonging to Facebook more than they feel to their own regimes. Uh, and, and, and that is bound to bring about a sense of at least democratizing the conversation that, you know, that these people go through. And uh, I'm happy to report that that actually worked. Um, but how did that effect happen, and, and who did it, did it affect? Think of the activists in Egypt, or in any place, really, as you know, in terms of these circular uh, thingies. It's like peeling an onion, kind of. You know? So the, the core group of activists are the people at the very center of that circle, uh, the very heart of the onion. <laughs> Uh, these are people who have been activists for years and years and years, long before the internet, long before Facebook. Uh, some of them, I mean, I know people who are in their fourth generation activists. Um, I, you know, we have uh, a friend of ours who actually was in, was in jail when his son uh, was being born, his first son, and his son was on the demonstration a couple of months later, <laughs> literally, like, you know. And that guy is a fourth generation activist. Uh, he's, he's now, you know, he's witnessed four generations of people going on protests. So these people were not affected by Facebook, you know, obviously. If anything, these people actually used Facebook and Twitter and blogs to bring about effect to somebody else. And the somebody else, I will claim, are the people on the outer circles of that, uh, of that layered uh, thingy. So I, I would think, for example, that I was among the yellow uh, level there. 
Um, so I was very closely watching what these people are doing, partly because I was a researcher. We were just talking about that uh, earlier. You know, I was this, you know, uh, trying to maintain my distance, objective, kind of, you know, doing my academic research, doing whatever. I had never been on a demonstration myself, but I followed what these people were doing. Uh, and I read their blogs and I read their messages on the social networking circles. Uh, and they weren't all the time, by the way, very serious and dry. Sometimes they were in the form of political jokes, for example. Uh, Egypt is notorious for the Egyptian people in general for, <laughs> for sarcasm. I mean, you know, something will happen, something very serious will happen. And like five minutes later, you'll find all these text messages on your phone, you know, with like hilarious jokes being flown around, you know, about this very serious thing that just took place. But I think it's very important because it's a, it's a defense mechanism against the gravity of some of the events. And it's also helped to sort of ease people into the political conversation and make them engage in it, even if it's through a joke, even if it's you know, through something that, again, on the outside seems to be very trivial and be very funny and you know, we're in it just to have a good time. Uh, but what that's happened is that when January 25 uh, was to happen, when literally the, the, a, a couple of things, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you how sort of events led to that, but what, what happened in my opinion is when it was time on January the 25th, everybody who was kind of reading these messages from afar, maybe for a month, maybe for years, maybe for days, was just ready to go out and do something. And so when the momentum hit the streets and where people were out on the streets literally just calling to others to come join the demonstration, people were looking from their windows and literally just going down and joining the demonstration. And that's, again, the interpersonal communication thing that was very important. But it was, there was something in there that made people ready to go down when the time was right, that made people uh, have a certain um, agreement to, to the, the righteousness of this, that this, this is the right thing to do, this is the correct thing to do at this point. Uh, and I'll go through uh, some of the examples of what I think, this is another of these pictures that just went uh, viral. Um, that sort of chronicles the, the story of, of political activism online in Egypt. Uh, that kind of started with blogging, literally. That was the first um, major thing. And this guy, Wael Abbas, is one of our uh, more, more famous uh, bloggers uh, and one of the earlier uh, bloggers. He used to be a journalist and he was fired because he was writing stuff that his publisher did not want to bother with, basically. So he decided to start an online uh, magazine, a blog, literally. Uh, and uh, in Arabic, it actually says uh, the, the blog of the Egyptian consciousness, and then it says uh, uh, this, is, uh, this works just according to the whims of its uh, publisher, which is himself, of course, who does not work for anybody. So you know, it's just a very strong statement of independence, editorial independence in terms of uh, content. Uh, Wael was very instrumental in bringing to light some of the major cases of police brutality, which have been happening forever in Egypt and which nobody spoke about whatsoever. So this is one of these instances of you know, a topic, a very important topic, obviously, uh, that none of the traditional media had the courage to even mention uh, before until these people started putting all these videos online, uh, first on their blogs and then when YouTube you know, I was, uh, was around then, you know, things became much easier because you could then put things on, on YouTube and people would watch them and would uh, circulate them uh, around. Uh, one of the cases that he was very instrumental in was in uh, 2007, a very um, notorious case, and it became notorious because the traditional media kind of had to pick up on it after that, after Wael Abbas brought it to light. Uh, of a guy who, a microbus driver who was uh, detained by a police officer, uh, taken into custody, tortured, raped, basically, sodomized by stick. And uh, interestingly enough, another police officer shot a video of all this happening because they wanted to humiliate the guy. They thought it would be funny. 
to you know shoot a video and just send it around to his you know family and to himself first and to his family and friends and to his colleagues so that he would become an example uh, of you know don't speak to a police officer in a way that the police officer does not like uh, that video reached well Abbas who put it on his blog they managed to get to the guy and try to convince him to file a lawsuit the guy was terrified he would not have anything to do with it and in all honesty it took one good cop who talked to the guy and said look you have to follow through with this you cannot let this go and eventually the guy did file a lawsuit and this became the first case ever in Egyptian history where two police officers got three year sentences each for a police brutality crime and that was a big victory Granted, you might say, ah, oh, three years for everything that they did, you know. But believe me, 7,000 years of history, this has been happening for 7,000 years. This is the first time ever that somebody was actually taken to court, that the court actually ruled in favor of the victim, and that something actually happened and two police officers were taken to jail. That's a big thing. And it was also a very big thing for the bloggers because they felt that their blogging can actually make a difference you know I mean this this works we can do this and it's um, it also worked uh, uh, this particular incident and others but this particular incident was a very main reason why Wael Abbas was awarded the uh, International Center for Journalists Award uh, the Knight Fellowship Award in 2007 and that I think was very important for a few reasons number one it's an acknowledgement of what this guy did uh, and how important it was. But number two, it, uh, it was an acknowledgement on the part of such a prestigious journalism institution that blogging constitutes journalism. Because this is, historically, this has always been a traditional journalism organization. Uh, and so all of a sudden, this was the first time ever that this award was given to a blogger. And, you know, at that time, there was this whole debate of, you know, is citizen journalism really journalism? Can we really count on that? And guess what? You know, this is this international recognition from this very prestigious organization that tells you it is. Uh, and that, again, gave these guys a huge boost for what was happening. Right around that same time, 2005 to 2007, there came about uh, this group of people uh, who called themselves uh, the National Coalition for Change, and they're their short uh, name was Kifaya. Kifaya is an Arabic word that means enough. And they're basically were saying enough to Hosni Mubarak and enough to his son. We don't want you and we don't want your son to succeed you. This is, you know, you've been here 25 years. Thank you very much. Go home. Uh, these people were quite instrumental because this was the first time ever that Egyptians heard somebody chant down with Hosni Mubarak. Um, it might have been happening before on a very small scale. Nobody knew of it. And really the reason why people knew of it when Kifaya was uh, brought to existence was that this was around the same time that YouTube was introduced. And so, you know, they managed to film their own protests and put it on YouTube. And it, again, went viral and people would circulate it on email and stuff. Uh, and of course, like, you know, like a large demonstration will be like, hundred people you know like <laughs> this was this was the big demonstration and it was big for that time you know if they had 200 people that that was you know huge um, but it was it was interesting to hear people and to see people's reaction to hearing people chanting down with Hosni Mubarak because they've never heard that before and it makes you realize and again it's this is one other very important aspect of social networking it makes you realize that you're not alone <laughs> You know, because I'm sitting at home saying down with Hosni Mubarak. I've never, you know, gone on the street and said that. But guess what? There's somebody who's much braver than I am who was there today at the journalist syndicate actually shouting that out loud, you know, uh, with, with people filming. Um, and so it makes you feel that, you know, there are other people who think I'm not crazy. There, you know, there are other people out there who, who think the same thing, who would really want to see that uh, happen. Uh, this is another very important movement, the April 6th uh, movement, which uh, became very instrumental in the, in the revolution as well, it's still very active to this day. This group came about through the efforts of a 28-year-old uh, uh, female blogger who in um, 2008 
uh, on April 6th of 2000, 2008, there was a demonstration being uh, uh, put together by workers in an industrial city in Egypt uh, who were protesting for higher wages, basically. Uh, and this blogger felt that you know she wanted to do something to you know to morally support these people. She thought if she asked people to go out on demonstrations in Cairo, that would probably be too dangerous; nobody would go. And so she asked people to stay home, don't do anything, just try to boycott everything that day. Try to you know don't go to work, don't send your kids to school, don't buy anything, don't just stay home if you can. Uh, and again, it's kind of you know, spiraled um, somehow. Uh, and on April the 6th of 2008, there were 73,000 people on that Facebook page, which in terms of Egyptian numbers was just huge. When we're talking about 2008, Facebook was still, you know, relatively very new. Uh, and to this day, 73,000 people is a big number for, for Egyptian uh, followers on, on any web page. Um, one of our um, uh, comrades, I guess, <laughs> uh, friends, was, was on television a couple of days before that talking about something totally different. And she, and this is usually how we make the, the link to traditional television, by the way, she uh, made sure to mention that Isra Abdel Fattah has this webpage on, uh, on uh, uh, Facebook, and there is a call for people to not go to work on April the 6th in solidarity with the workers of Mahal al Kubra. And so all of a sudden, this became sort of a national <laughs> movement, you know, to, to heed the call, kind of. And on April the 6th, 2008, Egypt literally came to a standstill. There was nobody on the streets. And it was very surprising, even to the people who have, you know, I mean, even to Isra and to the people who, who started the webpage and who called for this, because they would never have thought, you know, I mean, all they did literally was create an event on Facebook. It takes like five minutes. Mm -hmm. But all of a sudden, there was this realization of, look what we can do with Facebook. Look what we can do with a Facebook page. We basically brought the country to a standstill. Uh, of course, Isra was detained for a couple of weeks after that. <laughs> and then when there was a court order to release her, she uh, disappeared for another five days. Disappeared meaning she was still inside prison, but they didn't get her out. Uh, but, you know, I mean, that's a price that these very courageous people are willing to pay. Uh, and she still remains very active to this day. And, and this uh, page, which later became a major political movement, uh, still remains very active to this day. Muhammad al Baradei uh, was another of these figures. Uh, you might have heard of him. He was the, uh, the ex-chief uh, uh, of the uh, International Atomic Agency. Uh, and he was uh, hailed as a contestant, a possible contestant to Mubarak, uh, when Mubarak was still in power, had a lot to do with the National Coalition for Change and the Kifaya movement. And, and, um, and again, most of his uh, activism was carried out online uh, through Facebook and, and later Twitter. Actually, now the criticism that he uh, is facing the most, which, is, which I kind of agree with, unfortunately, is that he has taken this a bit too far, so he's only online, <laughs> and he is not out on the streets. Uh, and I, I kind of believe that's true, actually. I mean, he's, he's missed uh, quite a few golden opportunities that could have uh, taken Egypt out of this mess that we're now in, uh, because the revolutionaries were basically at his door asking him to take over. And there were a few moments during the two years where that could have happened, and he had enough support for that to happen, and he just didn't. Um, but his page, again, uh, 625 million, uh, sorry, 1,000 uh, followers. That remains uh, uh, one of the most popular pages on, um, on Facebook. Uh, this page, however, is probably the most important of all, at over 2.5 million followers now, which is, again, huge. Uh, this is the page that probably had the main role in, in organizing the events of the January 25th, uh, 2011. This is uh, Khaled Said, who was a 28-year-old um, blogger. He was brutally beaten to death outside an internet cafe in Alexandria on June 6, 2010. Um, this page came to existence soon afterward. We, at the time, it was anonymous. We now know who's running it, but at that time, we didn't. And. Um, 
it was run by a few of his friends, basically, his uh, activist uh, friends. Among them, you might, heard, you might have heard the name Wael Ghanim. He's the Google executive who was, uh, he now has a book out and whatever. Uh, but these people were very instrumental, and they did a great job, actually. Uh, the first thing they did was they asked people to go on small, silent, sort of uh, stand-up protests in Alexandria, his hometown. Uh, and they asked people to sit, to just stand on the Corniche, on the, on the Mediterranean, in a black T-shirt, and just stand there silently for an hour. You know, if you want to read a book, if you want to pray for Khalid, if you want to, you know, whatever you want, just, just stand there for an hour and go home. Uh, and at the beginning, it started out very small with sort of a few friends outside his house. Uh, and then it, it kind of grew bigger and bigger and bigger uh, until it became a national movement. So when they called for one of these uh, uh, silent demonstration kind of thingies, there were people demonstrating in all of Egypt's 27 governorates. Uh, for Khalid Said, um, again wearing a black T-shirt, standing there for an hour and going home. Uh, it was quite instrumental in a few ways. First of all, it, I mean, the, I, at one point in time, I would just like hit the refresh button and see the numbers grow, grow <laughs> larger, the, the followers on the page. It was, it was crazy uh, because that's very unlikely of any Facebook page uh, in, in Egypt for that to happen. But it was also quite interesting because it, it again, kind of built this notion of uh, let's get people involved in the conversation as much as possible. And so, for example, even if it was very small things, such as, okay, we have a demonstration next uh, Friday at 2 p.m. Would you like to stand on this street or on that street? And eventually, they would literally get thousands of answers. I mean, I would look at the page, and there would be like, you know, 6,000 answers, 8,000 answers, and which was amazing to begin with. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, the, if you have a very popular post on Facebook, it gets you like, you know, 100, 200, you know, replies. Uh, but the other thing that was more amazing to me as, uh, at the time, a distant researcher trying to observe this, was that somebody was actually tabulating these results and posting a tally of the numbers of who wanted to demonstrate on these on that street and who wanted to demonstrate on that street and you know the bigger the larger number of votes you know sort of uh, uh, won the debate and and I was like man this is this is huge you know because because even if it if it sounded like such a trivial matter again which street to demonstrate on you know it's not that important but no it is important because you're teaching these people who are mostly again teenagers and in their early 20s that their vote counts i mean vote for something these people have never voted in their lives right because if you, i mean very few people voted in egypt to begin with because you knew the who the elections were going to anyway so you, there's really no need to vote it's a, you know it's a stupid game um, and so these people in particular, particularly these young people, they've never voted in their lives, you know, because they know it's useless. Their voice doesn't count. And they're, they're, they grow up with the culture of your voice does not count. So, you know, really the messages don't bother, you know. <laughs> but even if you bother, thank you very much, will give us, you know, the impression that this is legitimate. There were people outside the voting booth. Your voice won't count anyway. Um, and so this, this page, I thought, was just changing this whole culture. Because every time they would post one of these questions, the number of replies would increase. And it was obvious that people are getting the message, if you reply to this question, your voice will make a difference. Your voice will count for something. Um, and this was the page that eventually posted the event for uh, the Day of Rage on January 25th, 2011. And I remember... A couple of weeks before that, I was at a friend's place, and we were watching on Al Jazeera as Ben Ali, the president, the ex-president of Tunisia, had fled the country. And we were just in disbelief. I mean, we were just, all of us were in tears. We're like, wow, I mean, these people leave. You know, they, they go away. Uh, and I remember we were kind of looking around at each other, and I later realized that this was kind of a national feeling, really, that, you know, people were like, Wait a minute, how come the Tunisians did it first? <laughs> you 
<laughs> we're Egypt. We're like the leaders of the Arab world and whatever. We, <laughs> we should have done that first. Yeah? They're 80 million. We're 80 million. They're, they're just 10 million. We should, we should have done that before they did. Uh, and so we were kind of sitting there contemplating, you know, will something happen tomorrow? Will people go out on the streets of Cairo tomorrow? Uh, we, we got up in the morning and we were quite disappointed because nothing happened tomorrow. Uh, there was like a minor, it wasn't really a demonstration, it was like a, a celebratory protest outside the Tunisian embassy, but really nothing major happened. And we were kind of frustrated, but then, you know, before long, a day later or something, this page posted that announcement for the Day of Rage, January 25. And January 25 is police day in Egypt. Uh, and so that's why their, their choice of the day, because of course they, I mean, the Ministry of Interior, these police officers had killed Khaled Said, and so uh, that was their main enemy. And that was what these protests were calling for. They were calling for uh, the downfall of the Minister of Interior. Nobody at that point was talking about Mubarak. They were talking about the Minister of Interior. Uh, and as I always say, Thank God for our biggest and greatest weapon of all, the stupidity of the regimes <laughs> and the arrogance of the regimes. Seriously, I mean, that's, that really <laughs> is what helped us the most because had Mubarak changed his Minister of Interior on January 25, he would have probably been in power to this day or his son would have been in power uh, because nobody was calling for Mubarak to step down. Uh, these people would have been very satisfied. They would have thought they got a great victory out of it. They would have, well, you know, gone home that day very happy uh, that they had sort of, you know, gotten, you know, had to sort of gotten his, his uh, revenge <laughs> thing kind of back. Uh, but no, the regime wouldn't listen uh, because the regime thought that as with everything else, you know, they will be able to ride this through. Which is, by the way, the exact same thing that's happening now as we speak on the streets of Cairo, which is why I'm very hopeful. Because it's always, I mean, you know, the regime hasn't changed really in Egypt. The head of the regime changed, you know, Muslim Brotherhood, army, whatever. They're, in my opinion, they're part of the same coin. They're, you know, they're two sides of the same, they're four sides of the same coin. However many sides, it's the same coin. Uh, and so, they're still demonstrating the same amount of arrogance and stupidity. And that's why I'm very hopeful, because the Egyptians are learning. The Egyptians have um, decided that they will not take things lying down. It's not going to happen anymore. And so we're in this for as long as it takes. You know? uh, but what happened on January 25th and the days after that is that the, the government kept escalating things basically through uh, attacking the, the protesters and the demands of the protesters kept getting higher uh, until, you know, until Mubarak was overthrown. Uh, and that kind of, uh, hopefully, <laughs> the same thing that will, uh, that will happen. Um, but that page was actually also instrumental in the way it organized things because it was, it was very well organized. It put down uh, names of venues, the major squares in every major city in Egypt of where people were going to demonstrate. It told them what to take with them, what to wear, uh, you know, what to put in your backpack. It gave them numbers to call if things got violent or if somebody got detained or injured. I mean, it, just, it was just very well organized. And the event that they had posted had close to half a million people signing on that they are attending the Day of Rage. And again, think back to the power of numbers thing, you know, the I am not alone concept. If you want to go down, you know, people didn't go down on demonstrations in Cairo because you knew you're going to go down, demonstrate with, you know, 100, 200 people, and you're going to get beaten. The police are going to beat the crap out of you. And, you know, you'd be lucky if you went home that day. But if there are half a million people signing on to go to a demonstration, <laughs> you know, if only 5% of these people actually carry through in their word and actually go, that's a lot of people. So you're kind of safe, relatively. I mean, there is a much higher chance of you getting home that day without being beaten because it's just power in the numbers. There's so many people. And that, I think, was just amazing to, to see the figures on these uh, events because it, it kind of told people that there is momentum and there, you know, there are things happening uh, that we shouldn't uh, take lightly. 
Uh, I'm now going to tell you a little bit about the initiatives that have taken place since uh, uh, the 18 days. This is one of the initiatives that I'm very involved with. Uh, it's a campaign for uh, the victims of military trials uh, that the army has been subjecting civilians to. Uh, we've had anywhere between 12 to 16,000 civilians uh, tried by the army in military trials since uh, the revolution. Uh, this basically means that the army is uh, the prosecutor and the judge, and in a lot of cases, actually the criminal. Uh, but of course, that doesn't. <laughs> uh, it also means that if you are in one of these uh, uh, cases, you most likely will not get a lawyer. You might get one on paper, but you know they're not really uh, going to stand up for you. Um, there's no real trial. We know people who, have, uh, who were tried in the kitchen of the military uh, prison at 12 midnight uh, with no lawyers present. We know people who were just uh, you know, taken into an officer's uh, uh, um, office where they just, you know, just write them down on paper. They just look at them and they're like, okay, five years, 10 years, <laughs> 15 years. Uh, and it's, it's become, you know, I mean, it's, it's a joke, really. Um, and it's very unfortunate because they can do whatever they want. Um, there is, a, there is an article in the, in the law ju uh, governing uh, military trials that dictates that the military court has the right to undertake, to, to determine its own jurisdiction. So they can just point at any, any civilian case, literally, if it has absolutely nothing to do with the military, and say, you know what, I'm interested in that. That goes to the military court. <laughs> and then it becomes a military case. Um, of course, I mean, they don't, they don't do it like that. But since the revolution, there have been... Uh, as I say, 12 to 16,000 cases of people. We, for example, uh, among the campaigns that we did was a campaign for a guy, he's 19 years old, was taken out of his own house uh, two days after he had undergone surgery. So he was kind of recuperating at his house. Uh, of course, these are very underprivileged, you know, like the lowest socioeconomic classes of Egyptians. Um, um, taken to military courts, given a 25-year sentence. Uh, for allegedly having a box of Molotov cocktails in his house. Um, <laughs> we had a huge campaign for this guy. And after months, we managed to get him to be retried in a different circuit in military court. And they set him free. They said he was innocent. So this guy was about to spend 25 years of his life in jail for something that the same court later declared him innocent of. And that just gives you an idea. He's not the only one. There are, you know, are 16,000 others. Uh, I am happy to report that only 1,100 remain in jail. The rest are all out. Uh, and we're not stopping before the last one is out. Because even if some of them have actually committed crimes, and we know that some of them did, and that probably that last thousand is the most difficult thousand because of that, because we know some of them actually did commit crimes. Uh, but we want them to be out of military jail, taken to a civilian court, undergoing a civilian you know, trial with a lawyer present, and then if they are to be found guilty, then they can serve whatever statement uh, the court gives them, but we don't want that to happen in a, in a military court. We want it to happen in a civilian court. Uh, that group has been very uh, um, efficient, I would, I would say. I'm, of course, biased because I'm part of it, but, <laughs> uh, but just judging by the numbers of people who are out and judging by the support, really. I mean, we have tremendous support now all over Egypt. Uh, we're one of the very few groups that nobody disagrees with. <laughs> you, know, yeah, I mean, you see that little sticker on anything, and it's just... Uh, and that sticker was my idea, by the way. I'm very proud of it. Uh, <laughs> uh, but in, in demonstrations, we had them in different sizes. We have some uh, rectangular ones, and people would just paste them, like put them on their, on their uh, shoulders. Um, uh, and, and so everybody on the square would have this yellow sticker kind of thing. And it was a very strong uh, statement uh, and a, lot of, a lot of the time. Uh, but what's fascinating about this group is that it, it almost does not meet. I mean, we, we have an email group and that's how we work we you know we've probably met like four times five times in, in the last couple of years um, smaller you know groups of people might meet within the group but the whole group really conducts its business on email uh, and that's what has been um, has been happening this is another very interesting campaign uh, it's called kadibun kadibun means liars 
And you can see the military cap up there. And the, the full name of the campaign is Askar Kazibun, which means the military, the, mili the, military, the generals are liars. Uh, and it's, it's been very interesting. This has worked in uh, coordination with another uh, initiative called Musirin. And the Musirin guys would go around and try to document filming, basically, flip cams, uh, the army and the police atrocities that were happening. And they would be like right there in the middle of stuff. And again, these are all like people in their early 20s. One of our friends, uh, 21, 24-year-old, um, she was shot with 118 birdshot bullets uh, all over her body, one of them landing four millimeters away from her eyeball. Uh, she's fine now, thank God. Miraculously, actually, she's, uh, she's absolutely fine. Uh, but, but I'm just trying to portray to you the courage of these people because they're like right there, literally, in the middle of the bullets and everything, and just you know, trying to document what's happening because they know that if they don't get that video, nobody else will. You know? Uh, and for, for the longest time, we had, and this, this campaign was very instrumental in that, because we had the, a very hard time convincing people that the army was committing any kind of atrocities. Because the army is very revered in Egypt. I mean, the Egyptian army is, you know, for, since 1973 now, we have hailed the army as, you know, the institution who has, uh, you know, uh, uh, given back dignity to the Arab people and, you know, because the, the war with Israel, which is portrayed in Egypt as a huge, humongous win, of course, for the Egyptian side. Uh, and so people love the army because if it wasn't for the army, we would be humiliated. But the army, you know, brought back the dignity of all these people. Uh, and so when, when the army first took over during the 18 days, people on the streets were, were you know, were shouting for the army to come down. Uh, they were chanting for the army. Everybody was taking pictures on, you know, on the uh, army vehicles and, you know, with hand in hand with the soldiers and whatever. It was just this huge uh, pro-army campaign. And so to try to convince people that, you know what, <laughs> that army you like so much, uh, they're really doing bad things, you know. They've conducted virginity checks on girls, you know, which is basically kind of rape. Um, and nobody would believe you. You know, they'd say you're either crazy or you're making this up or, you know. And so we started getting these videos, which were really instrumental. And then we started, this particular campaign uh, was actually very interesting. We posted all the videos uh, on, uh, they did, I'm not part of that, but uh, they posted all the videos on, on a website, on their website. And of course, and on Facebook, and on YouTube, I mean, it's everywhere. And they asked people, anybody, to just download a few videos and have a screening in your own neighborhood. Have a screening on your street. Uh, and at the beginning, people didn't know how kind of had to do that. You need some kind of a screen. And then people got very creative, said, you know what? White linen sheets, your bed sheets, that becomes your screen. So you post that between two trees, and that becomes the screen. Uh, and you rent a projector, which will cost you like $20 a night. Uh, you know, so a few people can even get together and you know, pay for that. And even in the poorer, poorer quarters of Egypt, you would have a Kadibun show right out on the street. And it reached a point where at any given night, we would have people reporting on Twitter that there are like 30, 40 different Kadibun shows you know, in different areas all over Egypt. And eventually, again, the traditional media had to pick up on it because everybody was talking about it. You know? And so these videos you know, were everywhere and they finally people started realizing that the army is not as nice as you think they are you know it's uh, it's not that uh, very nice institution that you think of it um, and so that that kind of was very interesting in that uh, uh, regard uh, this is state television so this is one of these logos because of course state TV lives on a diff very different planet in Egypt but, uh, so basically this is kind of what I've uh, been talking about uh, in terms of how uh, social media helped. Um, it's interesting now what's happening on, on the streets because while it's not necessarily organized through social media, what will happen is there will be an event on Facebook and people, there, there, has, uh, there has been this very symbiotic relationship between uh, the traditional media and the, and the bloggers and the core you know, internet activists whereby over the days they kind of learned that you know, they need television to be able to inform the whole nation of what's happening fast. 
And the people on television networks also realize that they need these bloggers because they're their main source of information. You know? um, and so we've now at a, at a stage where you can fairly easily and fairly quickly uh, reach a network of traditional media you know, uh, people, at least the, ma the major networks, and inform them that you know, there is this demonstration at, you know, tomorrow or there is this million person march on, on that day. Uh, and that immediately just generates a lot of uh, a lot of talk, and and it becomes uh, almost known immediately. Um, these are some more of these uh, pictures, and it, it was interesting the the different roles. I mean, you, you can tell that some of these people, you know, I mean, I bet you this guy doesn't have a Facebook page, you know, <laughs> and I and I hate to say that based on his looks, but you know, um, but really. You know, I mean, you know that these people are not on the internet, uh, but they, and they probably don't know exactly what Facebook is, but they know that there is this thing. You know, I mean, there are all these kids. One of the one of the sit-ins, we had a huge sit-in. Of course, there was a huge sit-in during the 18 days, but there was another huge sit-in in July of last year, and that one was a lot more uh, sort of advanced <laughs> uh, because the the uh, the strikers, the demonstrators, gained more experience, and so. In July, literally, I mean, we had a small city in the middle of the Hare Square. There was there was satellite television. There were people with you know like a small dish on top of their tents. Uh, there was internet access everywhere. There were you know uh, uh, electricity you know uh, to to plug in your computers and stuff. And these people knew that the people in the core of the square who spend the nights there every night are on their laptops typing something, doing something. Uh, and, and that's probably their whole idea of what of what Facebook and, and Twitter uh, are. But you know, I mean, it uh, it worked at some point. This was taken three hours out before Mubarak stepped down. So I, I was on a bathroom break. This is the Hare Square right be right behind me, uh, and this is a friend's apartment, which is very strategically located, like right on top of the Hare Square. Uh, but I like this picture because it. Because I, it makes me hopeful. <laughs> because three hours later, you know, the whole country changed. So uh, hopefully, we're we're continuing on that path. Thank you very much. I'll now take any questions you have. <laughs>